All right, we are pulling away from the shoreline here. Coming to you with yet another sermon from the wilds of northern Maine. Preaching in ways that nobody else dares preach in. Demonstrating that uh, nature is my where I go to worship the Lord. It's not my church because my church is what I am part of. Uh, if you're saved, you're part of the church as well. So I look really bright right now, I think, from looking at the video. So out here at an undisclosed lake in northern Maine, going to be doing a unique study today. Two unique studies from out here on the lake. Haven't done this before. Hopefully my camera and tripod will not fall in. That would kind of ruin the experience. Um, but I'm going to be doing a series of videos, seven videos coming up, a call to righteousness. This is the first one, of course, you can see the title, so you already knew that. But um, there's a lot of things that we need to have a call to. And, uh, you know, it's part of the job of a preacher is to look and see what does the world need, what does the body of Christ need. Um, we are supposed to be somewhat of a... Uh, spiritually armed camp if you will and so that's what we're going to be talking about today uh, of course we're not you know people have come out and said that i'm trying to call for war or something well i am spiritually speaking spiritual warfare is a is an appropriate thing for christians so trying to get away from the docks over here or the, the little not dock but the uh, boat unloading area on this lake here uh, some guys with their fishing boat and lots of beer so don't really care to be around that right now but uh, we'll get out here hope you're having a good um, day wherever you're at whatever you're doing you're probably not going to be watching this while kayaking a lake, so I imagine. Um, like I said, I'm just going to get out here a little bit better and uh, get some good views of the surrounding area. And um, trying to take it easy for my tripod. It's attached, but not permanently attached or anything. So we will see here. Got uh, Catherine and Oliver over there in their kayak. So, let's let me find a good place to go to here. Um, this would be a good time to thank everybody for praying for the ministry and uh, just for your support over the years, your friendship over the years. We, we really couldn't do it without the body of Christ, I'll tell you what. And, uh, one of the reasons I come out here is because I want to capture God's creation and the beauty of nature and to give you something that's enjoyable to watch. Not really enjoyable watching me all the time, I guess, but <laughs> just to demonstrate and the continuing thing, my goal is to demonstrate the fact that you don't need a stupid building called a church and you can have great fellowship with the Lord out here. So. All right, having said that, boy, that's actually fairly fairly shallow here, just a few feet deep out in the middle of the lake. So let me get us turned around here a little bit so you can see back that way, a little hill back there. Can't see any of the big mountains around here from this lake, but beautiful nonetheless. So we'll just kind of drift here for a little bit. Let me hook up my paddle here. I'm going to get my Bible out, my sermon notes. So today we're going to talk about a call to righteousness. Like I said, there's going to be seven of these studies coming out. I'm not sure about where I'm going to be preaching the other locations, but uh, we're going to start out in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 34 in the King James Bible. Horse fly, probably clinging on to me for dear life. Not much, uh, not many bugs out here, which is wonderful. Good place to 
preach at this time of the year in Maine because you have the black flies are pretty much ending right now, but still the mosquitoes and the horse flies and things. But uh, Proverbs 14, verse 34, Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is reproach to any people. Um, pretty much doesn't wor matter where you are. This will apply to your nation. Um, certainly America, I would say in many ways, is leading the world right now in terms of sin. Just unrepentant sin. Just people... I mean, I'm still shocked at the thing of pe what people call just, oh, it's not a problem now it's liberty or it's some other kind of thing I just it shocks me stuff that that nobody would have stood for years ago um, I mean you got Christians now that are using the f-word prof professing Christians they they smoke they drink they you know play video games they play the devil's music whatever and, oh we're Christians and if you stand against that then you're lost uh, what are they they're not righteous um, and I'm you know and of course you could make the distinction between righteousness God's righteousness and self-righteousness um, the book of Romans talks about the Jews, how that they go about to establish their own righteousness, and they haven't submitted themselves to the righteousness of God, certainly. But uh, righteous standards are what will help a nation thrive. And when you don't have standards of righteousness, and you have sin abounding, um, God's wrath will come on a nation like that. Um, and that's what we're seeing. I mean, when you get right down to it, all this economy shutting down and, and the coronavirus and, and the race war stuff, the cities burning and things and, and the there's you know uh, uh, droughts and fires and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, when you get right down to it it's God's judgment. And the economy falling apart, definitely God's judgment. So righteousness exalteth the nation. So then how do we keep things going until the catching up? You can just throw up your hands and just say, hey, it's, you know, the Lord's coming back. Watch the next study. Um, and so just forget about it. Um, but I'm not of that opinion. I believe in the in the Lord Jesus Christ coming before the time of Jacob's trouble, looking forward to it. But you know what? Um, we need to have righteousness. We need to exalt this nation with righteousness, not with the Constitution. The Constitution is a joke. Let's just face it. I mean, it is a joke. Uh, they, the, the politicians and things, and police, corrupt police, they will violate the Constitution at the drop of a hat. Hopefully you're not hearing the wind no noise here. So, um, that's just the way it is. But righteousness exalteth the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. I used to have that on the back of my truck, my pickup truck. So, um, let's go to the next verse. We're going to... It's a study on righteousness, and there's a whole lot of scriptures we could go over, but we're just going to hit the, the real good ones here. 2 Samuel, in your Old Testament, 2 Samuel chapter 22. It's kind of a, a new Bible here I'm using. Not, not new, but it's an old one. I didn't want to bring out my really good Cambridge one today because... I'm on a kayak in a lake. <laughs> I don't want, you know, if I have a problem, technical difficulty, I don't want to drop my Bible in. <laughs> Second Samuel chapter 22, beginning in verse 1, we're going to see more about righteousness, what it means to have righteousness. Let me get this. I need to kind of move myself so I'm not, I get the wind in my back. That would be a better idea. I don't really want the wind hitting the microphone. But 2 Samuel chapter 22, beginning in verse 1. Let's read here. Turn in your King James Bible. Don't forget to do that. And David spake unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord had delivered him out of the hand of all his enemies and out of the hand of Saul. There's a lot of songs in the Bible. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing making melody in your heart to the Lord. And he said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, the God of my rock, and him will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my high tower and my refuge. My Savior, thou savest me from violence. I will call on the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from mine enemies. When the waves of death compassed me, 
The floods of ungodly men made me afraid. You can see that today? Sure. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried to my God and did hear my voice out of his temple and my cry did enter into his ears. Crying unto the Lord is a, is a holy, righteous thing to do. You get lost people, they cry, they call upon the name of the Lord and say, God, I need help, please save me. The Lord's not going to, oh, sorry, no, nope. you know, you have to believe in your heart, you know. <laughs> sorry, just, just believe, just mentally assent to the facts of the gospel. You get somebody that's lost and cries out to God for help, God's not going to just ignore them, okay? If he sees their heart and they truly want to know the truth, he, he will lead them into the truth and ultimately belief of the gospel. But you start out by calling, okay? Very important. Um, then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of heaven moved and shook because he was wroth. There went up a smoke out of his nostrils and fire out of his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down and darkness was under his feet. And he rode upon a cherub and did fly. And he was seen upon the wings of the wind. And he made darkness pavilions round about him, dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. Through the brightness before through the brightness before him were coals of fire kindled. The Lord thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered his voice. And he sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning and discomfited them. And the channels of the sea appeared. The foundations of the world were discovered at the rebuking of the Lord and at the, at the blast of the breath of his nostrils. You know, when you actually, when we get to see the Lord, it's going to be a fearful thing. It isn't going to be a, hey, Jesus, hey, buddy. Ah, uh -uh, no. <laughs> Um, I mean, and how many how many modern Christian songs are even like this? Talk about the character of the Lord and, and how he just speaking and being in his presence is just this fearful, you know, experience. I mean, you know, lightning and thunder and, and things like that. The, his voice is like thunder. Wow. Verse 17, he sent from above, he took me, he drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy and from them that hated me. For they were too strong for me. I need the Lord's help delivering me out of the, the hand of people that hate me. There's too many of them. I can't fight them. If everybody gathered together that hates me and was going to have a fist fight with me or something, I, I'd get my clock cleaned, as they say. I wouldn't win. Plain and simple. The Lord has to deliver me. You too, by the way. Um, verse 19, they prevented me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my stay. He brought me forth also into a large place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands hath he recompensed me. There's the key verse in this passage. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. Hmm. You mean the Lord will reward you if you're righteous? You see something that's right and you say, I'm going to stand for that. And I don't care what people think about it. I will stand on this. It's right. I'm going to do it. The Lord will, re will reward you for that, for your righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands hath he recompensed me. I don't want to be messing around in sin. I don't want to do wicked things. You see? I might have to... Hopefully this is not, I can't tell right now if the wind noise is destroying or distorting this. Um, I hope it's not because it would really stink to have to redo this. <laughs> but let's continue here. Verse 22. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his judgments were before me. And as for his statutes, I did not depart from them. I was also upright before him and have kept myself from mine iniquity. Check that one out. You're fighting sin. We'll get back to this here in a little bit. Therefore the Lord hath recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to the, my cleanness in his eyesight. Huh. Getting a little choppy out here. There's <laughs> supposed to be some storms coming in later, so I guess we're experiencing some of that. Um, some of the wind picking up and everything here. But... Uh, Oh, what a waste of time it is to, to do all this righteous stuff. And you can't do this and you can't do that. And this is wrong and that's wrong. And you shouldn't this and you shouldn't that. Those are the things the Lord's convicting you of. The Holy Spirit comes and he convicts you and he says, I'm going to convict you of those sins. Son, daughter, I'm going to convict you. 
stop doing it. And you know what happens when you do? You know what happens when you turn against your sin and the wicked ways of this world? The Lord will reward you. I am living proof of that. I made a miserable wreck of my life through my 20s and all kinds of just doesn't even matter. It's just bad, stupid decisions. My health was bad, all kinds of things. I got saved about 26 years old, somewhere in there. And the Lord started to convict me and started to say, hey, you know, change this, change that, get rid of this, get rid of that. And you know something? Here I am today with great re rewards, great physical and spiritual rewards as well. Um, it's worth it. Getting rid of your sin is worth it every single time. There's never one time that you're going to get rid of a sin and go, oh, man, why did I do that? Boy, the Lord sure made me pay for getting rid of that sin. Boy, that was dumb. You know, I, I sure used to enjoy that, you know, life when I was a sinner. No. <laughs> you, you know, it's a good decision to get rid of sin. Let's go to the next passage here. Psalm 4. You say, well, this is Old Testament. This is Old Testament. Well, we're going to get to the New Testament, too. But I'm showing you things here. New Testament talks about the sure mercies of David. God had special grace for David because David's heart was right. He messed up a lot, but his heart was right. Psalm 4, verses 1 through 5. Hear me when I call, O God, of my righteousness. Hear me when I call, O God, of my righteousness. Thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. Have mercy upon me and hear my prayer. O ye sons of men, how long will ye turn my glory into shame? How long will ye love vanity and seek after leasing? Selah. But know that the Lord hath set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. And don't give me this thing, well, that's just because David was a saved man. Their salvation was different back there in the Old Testament. Okay? It was faith and works that they were under. God's grace has always been there. Sure. But nobody's ever, nobody's ever been saved by faith alone. That is a unscriptural teaching. Today, it's grace through faith. Okay? Back then, it was grace through faith and works. They had to do the sacrifices and, and the Levitical priesthood and the temple and everything else. That was there in the Old Testament. And by rights, David should have been put to death for committing adultery. But God didn't put him to death. Why? Because he had a broken, contrite spirit. And God was showing something. The way he dealt with King David was a future type of how he imputes righteousness to us. Because of him dying on the cross. Jesus dies on the cross. Now his righteousness is imputed to us. So the Lord was doing something very special there with, with David. Hopefully I'm not making anybody seasick while you're watching this. <laughs> it's kind of unique and new. Normally the camera stays fairly steady in my videos. But uh, we'll see how this goes. Just trying an experiment here today. If it was a little bit calmer, we'd probably be okay. Sorry about that. Getting really tossed around here. Tossed about with every wind of doctrine, you know? <laughs> Little application here today. I should just do a study on that. But uh, uh, verse 4. Stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. Selah. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord sacrifices of righteousness you say wait a second this is this is just crazy sin not and sacrifices of righteousness huh i mean seriously you're you're supposed to be a dispensational preacher here brian but you know sin not and sacrifices of righteousness oh come on this is just you're getting legalistic here or something turn your bible to first corinthians chapter 15 first corinthians chapter 15 in the new testament written to you as a christian today 1 Corinthians 15. I think I'm going to have to find a little cove or something here where it's not quite so windy and choppy out here in the middle of this lake. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Very true. Um, you get to messing around with people that uh, that are not, you know, getting victory over sin. They're They're making excuses for sin and whatever else and you start messing around and, and all of a sudden uh hey you know i i love brother brian's teaching but you know i i'm just uh 
I don't agree with them here and there and there and there and there. And pretty soon you start to, those people start to kind of pull you away a little bit. And um, those evil communications, the little backstab sessions, all of a st sudden start to become a major issue and they corrupt good manners. They get you to fall back in sin. Well, brother so-and-so, he, he has a, you know, he drinks occasionally and, you know, yeah, he gets drunk occasionally. But, I mean, he, he always repents of it and, and whatever. And, oh, well, sister so-and-so, she listens to this and she dresses that way and she this and she that. And pretty soon away you go. So, dragonflies are having a good time out here. But, um, let's look at verse 34. Awake to righteousness. A call to righteousness righteousness hmm. and sin not for some have not the knowledge of God I speak this to your shame you know what's a shame brethren you know one of the reasons why America is so wicked right now because Christians live so much like the world there's no difference anymore I speak this to your shame I speak it to my own shame we really don't have as strong a standards as we should we should have even stronger standards. And how about a New Testament command to sin not? Awake to righteousness and sin not. And yet if I would pre preach that and say that, they'd say it's lordship salvation. Oh, you're, you think you're sinlessly perfect and whatever. I, I never said sinless perfection. I've never said that I don't sin. But you know what? The Bible commands you to sin not. So what are you doing messing around with it? You say, well, if I mess up, you mess up, you get it under the blood. You say, hey, sorry, Lord, I know that you, you died on the cross. You, your sins, your, your, excuse me, your blood washed away my sins. They became your sins. Righteousness is imputed to me. Uh, sure, absolutely, but I sure am sorry for messing up. I sure am sorry, Lord, for, for what I did. God help me to get rid of that sin, get it out of my life. You know, I'd, I had to come to a place in life where I, I realized, you know, I'm looking at pornography. I don't want to look at this stuff anymore. I want to get victory over this. I don't want to just keep on making excuses and, well, I just had that, you know, I, was, uh, I saw a pretty girl and I kind of lusted and I didn't take care of that lust, you know, by getting it, you know, confessed and, and whatever. I lusted after her in my heart. So then I got home and, and I was all by myself and, you know, I got to thinking and, yeah, mm -hmm, yep. And you make excuses for the sin and uh, where's victory? Well, you know, I'll have it someday. No, stop it. Awake to righteousness and sin not. You know, there, there's, you study the book of Revelation, there's a, a great revival, so to speak, or a great movement coming, a, a great awakening, so to speak. And I believe it's going to be caused primarily by the catching up of the body of Christ. But the point is, there's a great multitude that gets saved in the future. So don't think that your labor is in vain. Don't think, well, you know, Lord's coming back soon, so I'm just going to, yeah, I'm not going to bother cleaning my life up talk about that in the next study you know who cares i'll just kind of uh live however no sense in trying to be sinless no sense in trying to get it all under you know victory over this sin and victory over that sin and quit doing this and quit doing that you're told to awake to righteousness and ironically in the same passage that it talks about the catching up of the body of christ later on verses 51 through 58 there in first corinthians 15 hmm awake to righteousness and sin not we need a call to righteousness. Uh, and, yet, you know, the lost, don't, don't even worry about the lost. The lost is going to say, oh, you're self-righteous. Oh, you can't, you, you just, you know, you're a Victorian prudery or puritanical, you know, they, they come up with all kinds of names for those of us who fight sin, those of us who preach against sin, speak against it. They'll come up with all kinds of titles and names for you. Yeah. <laughs> That's just the way it is. Next, let's go to, uh, let's see here. Uh, Psalm 11. Back to the Old Testament, to the book of Psalms. Kind of interesting how the Lord chose to be with fishermen and often we go out on a boat. I'm sure that their boat was a lot bigger than this one that I'm in, but uh, 
you know, just something kind of restful about being out in the water and just kind of a gentle rocking back and forth. <laughs> like I said, I'm sorry if I'm making any of you sick. You can just open up a new window and hear me preaching and not worry about watching the video, but we'll see here in the future what else we'll do. But Psalm 11, beginning in verse 1, And the Lord put I my trust, how say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain. For lo, the wicked bend their bow, they make ready their arrow upon the string, that they may privily shoot at the upright in heart. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Yeah, exactly. Hey, you know why the, the new version people, the, the I mean, the Jesuits literally came out with their own version, the Dewey Reams, before the King James was finished. 1610, they released their Dewey Reams to try and stop the King James Bible. And they tried to blow up King James, the members of parliament. It was called the Gunpowder Plot with Guy Fawkes. Um, they they want to do things to destroy the foundations. The King James Bible. And if the foundation is destroyed, if hey, if this book isn't true, if you can change this book and it's not accurate to the Greek and Hebrew and we can better translate it and whatever else, what can the righteous do? That's why Satan's ministers are constantly putting doubts in your mind about this blessed book. They'll come along and they'll say, well, you know, it could be translated this way and no Greek text says this or no, you know, whatever else and stuff. They do it all the time. I've dealt with these guys for so many years. It's just funny how any of them, you know, I mean, they, they, they're always going to get away with their devilment because they have their little church building that they can, you know, have their own rules and whatever else in it. But just disgusting. They're trying to destroy the foundations. And if they do, they take this away from you. What can the righteous do? What becomes your standard? You do. And you're a miserable, rotten standard. And you know that if you've been saved for a while. You can't rely on your feelings. And you can't rely on other people that profess to be saved. But let's continue. Verse 4. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence his soul hateth. Hmm. Oh, but God loves the sinner and hates the sin. Well, you're not reading that in the Bible. Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire and brimstone, and in horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. For the righteous Lord loveth righteousness. His countenance doth behold the upright. What a thought. Look up here. Look above you. Look up at the sky behind me. The God who created all this and runs this universe, he's watching you when you're upright, when you're righteous. When you say, I want that out of my life and I'm not going to do this and I'm going to forsake that and whatever else, the Lord looks down from heaven and he watches you and he rewards you. He'll recompense. He'll give you rewards for being righteous. Do we need a call to righteousness? Yes, we do. Yes, we absolutely do. It's a good thing. It's, it's not some kind of a you know, oh, just, you know, well, there's God. I, I trust in God's grace. You know, they turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. You know, basically, they do whatever they want with their flesh. And um, I trust in God's grace, and I just think we have liberty and, and everything else to just continue messing around with your sin. You know, you know what your life is as a Christian? One battle after another. It's war. It's fighting. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Second Timothy chapter 2. It's war. It's fighting. And you know that your biggest enemy is? Here's my biggest enemy right here. This guy right here has caused more trouble in my life than all the YouTube little goonies out there that have just mocked me and whatever else. This guy right here is a problem. My flesh. And your flesh is your biggest problem, your biggest enemy as well. You have to fight. You should want victory over your sins. Psalm 15. We'll go there next. Psalm 15. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor, 
in whose eyes a vile person is condemned, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. He that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent. He that doeth these things shall never be moved. Talk about some good instruction in what righteousness is. Some really good instruction there. Let's go next to uh, Leviticus chapter 19. This is an interesting thing here. The thing of, you know, you'll see in the New Testament, the Lord Jesus says about love thy neighbor as thyself. And you, you know, you think, okay, I can kind of get that. You, you speak truth to the neighbor, your neighbor, he's, that's a way of showing love to him. You, you, you help him if he needs help. You, you witness when you can and whatever else. But uh, there's a lot more to it than that. And it's written about back here in Leviticus chapter 19. Leviticus 19, verse 11. Uh, ye shall not steal, neither deal falsely, falsely, neither lie one to another. And ye shall not swear by name, by, excuse me, ye shall not swear by my name falsely, neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God, I am the Lord. Thou shalt not defraud thy neighbor, neither rob him. The wages of him that is hired shall not abide with thee all night until the morning. Kind of like the banks do. It's kind of funny. If you don't know this, the banks actually take your money when you have it in the bank, and they'll invest it all night long. Kind of interesting. Verse 14. Thou shalt not curse the deaf, nor put a stumbling block before the blind, but shalt fear thy God. I am the Lord. Ye shall not do unrighteous, or ye shall, not, ye shall, ye shall do no unrighteousness in judgment. Thou shalt not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty, but my, in righteousness shalt thou judge thy neighbor. Thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer among thy people, neither shalt thou stand against the blood of thy neighbor. I am the Lord. And you know, let me just say something. Uh, if you're aware of what's been going on with this ministry, there's been some talebearing and backbiting against me uh, from people that I thought were my friends. And you know something? You know what the biggest uh, temptation is? It's for me to start doing the same tail bearing and backbiting you know and and you know, we were talking about it my wife and i and i said you know what the lord's blessing us so much right now i don't even want to talk about this stuff i don't even want to care let's let's find a good day to, to head to the lake and we'll go out there and maybe i'll try doing a sermon and i want to enjoy life what's with this tail bearing and backbiting stuff and gossip and all that i don't care whatever People are going to stab you in the back. You know, Brian, uh, okay, whatever. I, I warned people about it and told, let the brethren know and please pray for, for me and whatever. Okay, get back to work. Get back to life. Get back to living. Here we are. But uh, I find it interesting there. Um, verse 15, In righteousness shalt thou judge thy neighbor. That's another part of righteousness, judging. I mean, you don't have to be a jerk or anything, but, but judge your neighbor. Say, hey, um, I don't think it's right what you're doing there, friend, or whatever. Judge your neighbor. But let's get back to it here. Um, verse 17, Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor, and not suffer sin upon him. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. There you have the statement, love thy neighbor as thyself. The Lord Jesus Christ spoke about that. And how do you love your neighbor? By being righteous. Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. When you're righteous and your neighbor sees that, they say, hey, that guy, he's got some kooky beliefs or whatever, but I'll tell you what, he'll help you. He's a, good, he's a good man. I trust him. Do you have a testimony like that with your neighbors? It's a challenge to all of us. Psalm 23. A very familiar psalm if you know anything at all about the Bible. Um, I actually did a video on this many years ago where I read from a bunch of different versions. And uh, it just comes out all jumbled and garbled and everything else. It's confusion. So I'll probably try to put a link to that at the end of the video here. But uh, Psalm 23, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Well, it's not really still right now, but <laughs> the still waters. 
Um, he restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Verse 3, He restoreth my soul, he leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yeah, very familiar psalm, but we don't often think about our part in it. It's just kind of, you know, Psalm 23, and you get the little picture of the Catholic Christ, and he's there with the little sheep or something. He's got a little shepherd staff. Um, oh, it's such a beautiful thing. What about your righteousness? God will reward you if you're righteous. Do you want God's reward? Uh, I don't know. I, I'm not really sure. Really? You should want God's righteousness in your life. Next, let's go to Psalm 35. Psalm 35. This is a new experience for me. This is my first study done on the water. I'll just kind of try to get the pages turned here. Ah, it is a challenge turning pages in the wind. I've done that before, but uh, on the wind and in the water? Well, not really. Challenge is I can't really, you know, turn my back to the wind so easily right now. Eh, come on here. Psalm 35, beginning in verse 17, down to verse 28. Lord, how long wilt thou look on? Rescue my soul from their destructions, my darling from the lions. I will give thee thanks in the great congregation. I will praise thee among much people. Let not them that are mine enemies wrongfully rejoice over me. Neither let them wink with the eye that hate me without a cause. For they speak not peace, but they devise deceitful matters against them that are quiet in the land. Yea, they opened their mouth wide against me and said, Aha, aha, our eye hath seen it. So funny, everybody turns against me, they'll just, they'll just dissect my videos. Why not dissect uh, Peter Ruckman's videos? Why not dissect uh, Lester Roloff or, or the preaching and sermons of D.L. Moody or any other great preacher? Or you could just go out and actually preach on your own. There's a thought, you know. What a, what a novel idea. Um, verse 22. This thou hast seen, O Lord. Keep not silence, O Lord. Be not far from me. Stir up thyself and awake to, to my judgment, even unto my calls, my God and my Lord. Judge me, O Lord, my God, according to thy righteousness, and let them not rejoice over me. Let them not say in their hearts, Ah, so, we would, so would we have it. Let them not say, We have swallowed him up, like the people trying to get me off YouTube all the time. Let them be ashamed and brought to confusion together that rejoice at mine hurt. Let them be clothed with shame and dishonor that magnify themselves against me. Let them shout for joy and be glad that favor my righteous calls. Yea, let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified, which hath pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. Thank you to everybody out there that defends this ministry. I know it gets you kicked around and you get called names, you get called Denlingerite and all this other stuff. But thank you. Thank you. I know none of you are Denlingerites. You don't worship me. I get that. But, you know, that's what these enemies will, will do. They'll, they'll come out and they'll say, Oh, you're a Denlingerite. You worship Denlinger and all this stuff. He's your Pope. He's your Holy Father and all this. Don't worry about that stuff. But, uh, you know, I just love how that, Let the Lord be magnified, which hath pleasure in, his, in the prosperity of his servant. Um, we're closing on the, the or we're going to be doing the paperwork and everything for the house we bought, new place for the ministry. I thank the Lord for that. It's going to be a lot more good material coming out. Some real good ideas. But verse 28, And my tongue shall speak of thy righteousness and of thy praise all the day long. Not just uh, 9 to 12 on Sunday morning. And then 6 to 7 Sunday evening. And then Wednesday night prayer meeting. or <laughs> All the day long. You can have a different relationship when you're with the Lord. And you're not tied to some stupid church building. <clears throat> Next, we're going to go to Acts. We're going to head to the New Testament now. Acts chapter 10. 
verse 34 and 35. Acts chapter 10. I guess some people would say I'm not qualified to preach out here because I don't have a pulpit. Be a little weird. <laughs> Acts chapter 10, verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive, perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. There's a transition happening at this part of the book of Acts where God isn't just dealing with the nation of Israel, with Jews anymore. Now he's starting to deal with the uh, Gentiles. And Peter looks and he says, God's no respecter of person. But, look at this, in verse 35, In every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Righteousness exalteth a nation. But sin is a reproach to any people. You say, well, well brother, we're going to have to get some kind of uh, laws done or laws passed or something that, that we can have National Righteousness Day. Or no, no, no. Let me explain righteousness. Because, you know, you look at the America, you say there's no way we're going to make this country righteous again. And you're right. Without war or something or, you know, a lot of things happening in this nation, we'll never bring this country back. There's not going to be any laws that will stop sodomite marriage or, you know, shut down the Jesuit institutions or something or, you know, destroy the wicked media. and think That's not going to happen. Um, how do we bring righteousness? How do we exalt this nation with righteousness? Uh, individual righteousness. You do what's right, like King David did. That's how we start it. Righteousness exalteth the nation. In every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Notice it does not say in every nation, they, the people of the nation, if you have the majority, the moral majority, or he, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness. An individual. Um, a nation that God will bless will have righteous people in it. That's, that's the only reason America has lasted so long, because there's a lot of righteous people. Acts chapter 13. Acts, Acts chapter 13, verse 6 through 12. And when they had gone through the isle unto Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But Elymas the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, in other words, Bar-Jesus, in other you know, his name by interpretation is Elymas, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O oh, fool of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Then the deputy... When he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Isn't that interesting? It isn't some kind of a thing where Paul says, well, Jesus loves you there, Elemis. And, and, you know, I really wish we could, you know, dialogue or something. He rebukes him hard and the guy goes blind as a result. Sometimes you have to do that as a saved Christian. Don't tell me this is some kind of an apostolic thing or whatever else. I think you can rebuke people in the name of the Lord. I've done it. I don't have any kind of apostolic powers. I haven't, you know, don't have the signs of the apostles or whatever else. But I rebuke these devils when I see that there's no desire in them for repentance from their false doctrine, from their false teaching. I rebuke you, you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. May the Lord Jesus Christ rebuke you. How dare you pervert the right ways of the Lord like that? Enemy of righteousness. And what happens? Lost people see that and they see, hey, this guy just went blind. This guy just got cancer. Wow. Wait a second. There's a power here. Hmm. And it's not with this guy. It's a different type of power. Must be the power of the Lord. And it is. 
and it's available to you. But uh, I'll just say this. Um, the power of the Lord in your life is directly proportional to how much sin you have victory over. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, I'm trying to think of the verse right now. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. People in the end times would be that way. They have a form of godliness, but they deny the power. Why? Well, they're, they might be saved, but they're not getting victory over sin. Where's the righteousness at? See, God isn't, it's not just righteousness. You do righteousness and God will recompense you with great riches and financial blessings and good health. and what, No, no, it's spiritual power as well. Wouldn't you like to have spiritual power? Well, that depends on your righteousness after you get saved. Before you're saved, well, any righteousness before you get saved is just self-righteousness. <laughs> you're just doing it for yourself. You haven't been broken and come to the Lord for salvation. Well, you don't have a right to righteousness. Let's go to the next place here. Um, Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, verse 19. Ah, come on here. Problem is, this is an older Bible that I, I don't really use it much. It was in just excellent condition when I bought it. So the pages are kind of not even really pulled apart yet. Um, Acts chapter 17, verse 29. I, I thought I said 19, but no, verse 29. Acts chapter 17, verse 29. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Oh, you know, it's, it's situation back in the Old Testament or something. Where I, I don't know how to get saved or I can't live in, you know, I, I whatever. Um, no, all men everywhere to be to repent. God's no respecter of persons for salvation. Um, <clears throat> verse 31, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained whereof he hath given assurance unto all men and then he hath raised him from the dead death burial and resurrection of jesus christ that's the gospel yeah you come to lord broken in a, in a state that you need to be fixed you say hey I, I i need some help here lord um my righteousness isn't going to do it i'd like to have your righteousness to help me get free from these wicked sins that i've been doing Yeah. And finally, let's go to Romans chapter 6. The book of Romans chapter 6. Verse 17 is where we're going to go. Romans 6 verse 17 down through the end of the chapter. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Well, righteousness is optional, brother Brian. We don't we don't have to do we don't have to be righteous. It's just you know you can. Then why are you called a servant? You're you're supposed to be a servant of righteousness. If it's just some kind of an optional, ah, you can if you want to. You don't need it. You know whatever. You're a servant of righteousness. Hmm. Verse 19. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were with the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Hmm. And this has been preached many times by many preachers, but the whole truth of the matter is, friend, sin earns you wages. You mess around in sin, you earn death. All sin is negative. 
Every single thing that's out there that's sin, it's all negative. Simple. But don't give me this thing of, well, I'm a Christian and I can just kind of live in sin and I don't need righteousness and I don't, I don't need to do this. And I, you're supposed to be a servant of sin. You're supposed to be ashamed of the sinful things that you used to do in your life. I look back at my lost life and I just think, there's times it still comes into my mind and I just say, I'm sorry, Lord. He's forgiven me. It's under the blood. I get it. But it just, it shames me. It shames me to think of the, the, the horrible Wicked things that I once did. Terrible. So why would I continue doing those things? You better think about that. Let's have a call to righteousness, brethren. We're supposed to be servants to righteousness. Awake to righteousness and sin not. Um, you know, I, I really don't want to have a situation where this nation just goes into this total FEMA lockdown, military martial law type of a deal. And next thing you know, we're, we're having, you know, Christians being put into concentration camps and whatever else. You say, well, how do we fight it, brother? Do we, do we write our congressman or congresswoman, congressperson? <laughs> uh, no, we fight it by uh, personal righteousness. Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. We need to think about righteousness, our own first, and uh, think about our neighbors. Think about people around us and say, you know what, hey, um, I'm not going to live in a way that my neighbor's going to say, oh, he's no different than me. My lost neighbors, are we get along just great because we're the same. We do the same things. Uh, no, it's not supposed to be that way. We're supposed to be different from the lost. I really hope you think about these things. I really hope you, that you pray about this stuff because it's so very important. Uh, without the right, righteousness of Jesus Christ in our lives, we're really good for nothing. The Bible talks about if the salt, salt has lost its savor, it's good for nothing. We're supposed to be salt. We're supposed to be light. We're supposed to have righteousness. So that's going to be it. Got one more study to do here. I need to paddle to a new area here. And uh, I guess we'll see you in the next study. Thank you very much for watching. King James Video Ministries has been faithfully preaching and teaching from God's Word since 2008. Our YouTube channel has never been monetized, and we do not accept money from the lost world because this would violate the Scriptures. King James Video Ministries is supported by saved brethren in accordance with 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17 through 18. If you have been blessed by our videos, we would ask that you prayerfully consider supporting this ministry financially. You can donate online by visiting www.kingjamesvideoministries.com or by sending a check or money order to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 214, Patton, Maine, 04765. Thank you to all who donate to this ministry and we pray for the Lord's blessing in your lives.